you will hear a conversation between a police officer and a woman who witnessed an accident. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello, madam. I understand you witnessed the accident. Have you got a few minutes to tell me what you saw? Yes, no problem. I don't have to be back at work for a while, so I'm pleased to help. Did you actually see what happened? Yes. I was standing over there, near the bus stop. I was on my way to get something for lunch and just happened to be looking at a shop across the road. That's when I saw the red car come out from the junction over there. You don't happen to know what time it occurred, do you? Well, I left work for my lunch break at one and it's only about ten minutes walk away. The office, I mean. So it might have been about ten past one. Although I did pop into the shop for something, so it was probably closer to one fifteen. So it pulled out of Monk's Road, that's the road over there, straight on to High Street. That's right, yes. Did you get a view of who was in the car? There were three of them. Two in the front, the driver of course, someone in the passenger seat and there was someone in the back. They were quite young. I doubt if they were much older than 20. Anyway, they came speeding out of the side road over there and hit that lady's bicycle. The driver didn't bother to stop to find out if she was OK. He just drove off along the main road towards the town centre. Uh, is the woman OK? She should be fine. She banged her head when she came off the bike, so we've called for an ambulance. They always like to check you out in case you have concussion. But no, she seems fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. The bike doesn't look too good, though. I don't think she'll be using that again. I suppose she was very lucky, really. If they'd hit her instead of the front wheel, she could have been seriously injured. It looked like they were just in a hurry and didn't want to stop at the junction. I know the traffic lights aren't working there, so perhaps they thought they could just pull out. Could you give me a description of the car? Do you know the make and model? Well, I'm not very good with cars, but I'm pretty sure it was the same model as my husband's car, a Ford Fiesta. It was red, like I said, and quite old, and the door on the driver's side was damaged. It looked like it had been in another accident some time ago. I don't suppose you had a chance to take down the registration number, did you? I did, actually. Let me see. Um, Why? For... 8 B Y W. Will that help you trace them? That's really helpful. It depends. It might be a stolen car, but at least we'll be able to trace the owner. If it wasn't stolen, then yes, we'll be able to find out the name of the driver. Now, would you mind giving me your contact details, just in case we need to get in touch about anything? Of course. What's your name? Mrs. Stansfield. Rita Stansfield. That's S-T-A-N-S-F-I-E-L-D. And your address, Mrs Stansfield? 19 Althorpe Road, Bradford. That's A-L-T-H-O-R-P-E. Have you got a telephone number we can get you on? Yes, it's 232 566 Double eight. And do you have a mobile number? Yes. O seven eight three four 
08989772. That's great, Mrs Stansfield. As I said, we may get in touch if we need any further information, but probably what you've told me is enough. Thanks for your time. No problem. I'm glad to have been of help. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a presenter on a radio show. The presenter is talking to the organiser of an arts festival. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hi again. I'm joined today by Ben Knightley from the Media and Arts Centre. He's here to tell us about the launch of the city's Arts Festival. Hi, Ben. This year has a particular focus, doesn't it? It does, yes. This year, we want to encourage more people who would not normally describe themselves as being creative to get involved with some of our many events and workshops. Not simply turning up as spectators, but to get involved themselves, to get their hands dirty, as it were. There's such a wide offering this year that I'm sure we'll have something to suit all tastes. You were telling me earlier how beneficial being creative can be for us. Absolutely. I recently attended a drawing workshop, and uh, <laughs> even if I do say so myself, came away with a very good sketch I'd done. But what was particularly surprising for me was my feeling of pride and joy when I looked at the sketch again and showed it to the family. It really took me back to the feelings I had as a youngster when I'd made something. I realised that, even as an adult, we can get just as much pleasure and happiness from creative activity. Actually, research has shown that the more we allow ourselves to be creative, the happier we feel. And the more positive our frame of mind, the more creative and the more curious we become about the world we live in. Well, you've certainly persuaded me. So what kind of events can we look forward to? We want to try and include as wide a range of people as possible this year. From people already involved in the creative arts through to elderly people who haven't been creative in years. So, for example, we're inviting people in the creative industries who occasionally suffer from writer's block to join us on one of our creative walks. Walking has been proved to aid creative thinking, and we're running a series of walks during the spring and summer around some of the many beauty spots in and around the city. Then there's our knitting programme. We're working with schools in the area to invite grandparents in to teach kids how to knit. It's a great opportunity to bridge the generation gap and rekindle that interest in knitting you may have forgotten about. We also aim to inspire and support people without jobs through a series of free courses, starting with creative writing workshops. These courses will give them an insight into the basic ingredients of a good short story and help participants get their ideas into shape. And for anyone out there who is looking for the chance to explore their creative side, come along to our printmaking workshops. You'll have the chance to study some fantastic prints by local artists, explore different print processes, and take home a print of your own to hang on a wall.
Before you hear the rest of the radio show, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Excellent. So how do we go about getting involved? If anyone is interested in joining one of these sessions, it's important that you contact us first, as places need to be booked beforehand. We ran similar sessions last year and demand was high. As I said previously, there's no charge for any of the workshops and materials, where appropriate, will be provided on the day. You can get further information on our website, and if you don't have access to the internet, call us on 514-2261. The booking office is open Monday to Friday from 9 to 5, but closes early on a Saturday at 12.30. Many thanks, Ben. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a university tutor and a student who has recently started at the university. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 25. Anyway, as this is our first session, I'd just like to find out how you're settling in, how your Spanish course is going. Basically, anything you feel you need to talk about. I'm OK, I suppose. I'm settling into my studies and I'm finding the course interesting. I've got a free day on Wednesday, which is good and the lectures and tutorials on the other four days. Yeah, I'm getting into the swing of things. I'm just missing home a little, that's all. OK. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I reckon half the students I speak with are a little homesick. It's only natural. Is this the first time you've lived away from home? Yes. I was thinking just this morning that I've never spent so long away from my friends and family before. I've been back home on one occasion since I started in September, but it's so expensive to get down to London by train that I can't go very often. Well, don't be too hard on yourself, Kevin. It's quite a lot to deal with at first, isn't it? Moving to a new city, being responsible for everything for the first time ever, shopping, cooking, etc. Then making new friends, and then there's your studies, of course, and getting organised. Are you living on campus or in town? On campus, in halls of residence. It's not as cheap as renting a room in a house, but I thought it would be a good way of meeting new students. We're all in and out of the kitchen during the day, so it's not difficult to socialise. Like you say, I'm just a bit homesick. I'm sure that you'll find things get better over the next few weeks. Everything's new for you at the moment and a little overwhelming. 
but you'll get into a routine and start to feel more settled. What about Freshers' Week? Did you sign up for anything? Yes, I've joined a couple of groups. There's the Film Society, and a tutor recommended the Spanish Society, so I've signed up for that too. I've volunteered to help out on their International Food Day, making snacks, that kind of thing, and I'm looking forward to getting to know other members. You said earlier you were finding your studies okay, so that's good as well. The main thing to remember is to try to be as organised as possible. You have so much more freedom to make your own decisions here, so it's important to structure your time to factor in time for studies. If you're on top of your work, you'll feel much more able to enjoy your free time. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Um, I was hoping you could help me with my essay writing. I seem to be spending ages writing and rewriting essays and, well... The best bet is for you to sign up to the University Writing Tutorial Service. They have people who are in place to support students specifically with these problems. To join, just fill in the application form and give them a sample of your work. Brilliant. I didn't know anything about that. Can I give them one of my essays to look at? They won't give you feedback on a complete essay, I'm afraid, as they may not be subject experts. It's really aimed at developing your academic writing skills. Ideally, you should write something between 1,000 to 1,500 words. If you find their page on the university website, they've got a list of general topics you can try. So, do I just turn up, or do I need to make an appointment? I've got an essay deadline coming up soon, so I'd like to get help as soon as possible. You'll need to arrange an appointment. The first step is to sign up for the service. Download the application form and essay title from the web page. Don't forget to state when you're available for tutorials on the form. Email the essay and form to the team and they'll get back to you with an appointment time. It usually takes about one week from when they first receive your essay to arrange an appointment. You're usually given one tutorial a term, but they may offer you further sessions if they think you need them. OK, I'll do that. Thanks for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on archaeology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Many thanks for inviting me along today to talk to you about the results of some very interesting recent archaeological research. The saying, you are what you eat, is often applied to present-day dietary advice. Certainly, our bodies will show evidence of whether we eat healthily or live on fast food and takeaways. This can be particularly useful in archaeological research. Through a careful analysis of the ancient bones of our ancestors, we can tell a great deal about their diet and the way they lived. I'd like to talk to you today about some research into the early settlers of some remote tropical islands in the Pacific. When these people travelled to these new lands 3,000 years ago, they had to bring along all the resources they needed for survival, including food, plants and animals from their original homes. One such group were the Lapita people, who were early settlers of remote Oceania, several islands in the Pacific. When the Lapita set sail for the island Vanuatu, they brought with them domestic animals and crop plants. This allowed them to settle in an area where no humans had previously lived and that had limited natural resources. Archaeologists have been keen to discover to what extent these settlers and their domestic animals relied on the resources they'd brought with them compared to the native plants and animals they found on the island. In order to try and understand the diet and lives of the Lapita people, archaeologists analysed the chemical composition of the bones of 50 adults excavated from the Lapita Cemetery on Ifate Island, Vanuatu. Depending on what we eat, we consume varying amounts of carbon, nitrogen and sulphur. As these chemical elements are ultimately deposited in our bones, the amounts or ratios of each one can provide a sort of dietary signature. For instance, plants incorporate nitrogen into their tissues, and as animals eat plants and other animals, nitrogen builds up in their own system. The presence of different ratios of chemical elements may show whether a human or an animal ate plants, animals or both. Carbon and sulphur ratios offer another clue to diet. Carbon ratios, for example, differ between land and water organisms, as do sulphur ratios, the values of which are much higher in aquatic organisms compared to land-based organisms. As well as examining the settlers' bones, scientists carried out a comprehensive analysis of the chemical elements found in the settlers' likely food sources. This included modern and ancient plants and animals. They found that early Lapita inhabitants of Vanuatu may have searched for food rather than relying entirely on food they'd grown themselves during the early stages of colonisation. In the longer term, they probably did grow and consume food from the resources they'd brought with them, but early on, they appear to have relied as much on a mixture of fish, marine turtles and fruit bats, as well as their own domestic land animals. They also provide clues to the culture of the settlers. For one thing, males had much higher nitrogen levels compared to females, which indicates greater access to meat. This difference in food consumption may support the hypothesis that Lapita societies were ranked in some way, or it may suggest dietary differences associated with the work people were involved in. Additionally, the archaeologists analysed ancient pig and chicken bones and found that carbon levels in the settlers' domestic animals indicated that they were eating a diet mainly of plants. However, their nitrogen levels indicate that they may also have roamed freely, eating foods such as insects. This would have allowed the Lapita people to keep food resources that were in short supply for themselves, rather than feeding them to their domestic animals. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.